Well, protein engineering and structural biology is what I might do in my day job, but it's not what I'm talking about tonight. So um, <laughs> try not to be too confused, or more confused than me. I'm talking about DNA information age and the, the possible impact that low-cost, easily accessible DNA information might have on science and society. And uh, I've broken this down into the past, uh, the future, question mark, and, and the present. And uh, starting with the past, a rare instant of logic in, in this talk. Um, anybody know, uh, got any clue who this is, this person on this slide? That's cheating. I bet you've seen the slide. So Nikola Tesla was uh, an inventor. Um, he was, you know, dealing with electricity and magnetism. And apparently, he, uh, in 1926, he was foreseeing the, the, the internet. So he's saying when you have perfect wireless, you'll have this huge brain, which is essentially what we have now with the internet. And even more impressively, he, he foresaw that people would be carrying around in their pockets devices to, to connect to and manipulate this network, this wireless network. Yeah, so we have mobile phones, and we, we use these to connect to the internet. And whether that's a good thing or not, you know, I think they're probably dastardly destroyers of attention span and maybe even childhood. But... Um, and I know at least one teacher at this school, or used to be at the school, agrees with that. So the future question mark, where is the future? So the Internet of Things may, may already be with us to some extent. So the idea that you have smart devices, and uh, these are connected, and they respond to information in real time so you can make informed decisions. So a potential flaw with something like the Internet of Things might be that it gives people like Mr. Putin uh, the opportunity to send his... Uh, Elite squads of hackers. So uh, here they are arriving in the, ne in the Netherlands uh, not so long ago. Uh, and they might, you know, for example, try to hack into your smart toaster or your smart kettle and uh, burn your toast, burn out your kettle and disrupt the, the Great British breakfast. Send out disgruntled uh, workers um, so we get lower productivity, economic ruin, and Russian world domination. So what about an internet of living things? This might be my, more frontier, more future, more futuristic. So this is where we have, uh, we, we, we need, uh, we're talking about an interface between technology and biology. So between your mobile phones or um, devices like this that I'm going to talk about in a minute. So this is a DNA sequencer, uh, highly mobile and uh, portable and, and uh, things like that. So, um, in the Internet of Living Things, is it, is it uh, what is, um, if we can create such a network, we probably envisage that DNA-based information is going to be a major part of this. So why do I say that? Well, DNA, as many of you will know, this is the molecule that is the blueprint of life. It's, it's the molecule that determines how living organisms are built and how they operate. And this molecule, as you probably know, it has this... It has this, uh, comprises this, these two strands that run in anti-parallel directions in this iconic double helical structure. And what holds these two strands together are pairs of bases on opposite strands. And it's these, four, these bases, these chemical structures, these four chemical structures that make up the code of life. And I'll be talking about base pairs going forward. So base pairs are just these, these pairs of bases uh, on the opposite strands that hold these two strands together. And it's the sequence of these bases, the G, A, T, and C, just four types of chemical structure that determine uh, how, we are, how we are built and how we operate. This is the blueprint molecule for all living organisms. So DNA is found in all living organisms. We don't really consider viruses to be uh, living, living things. So viruses can, can have RNA-based genomes. Um, so the genome is the, the genetic material in the cells of living organisms. So the genome of a bacterium, for example, a typical bacterium, the genome is about four million of these base pairs long. Uh, mammals, the genome is more, more like billions of base pairs long. Plants can have even bigger uh, genomes. So um, all humans are only about, they vary by about, by about 1% in genome sequence. And it'd be interesting to know whether people like Donald Trump, for example, show a greater variation than that 1%. <laughs> so that you would imagine there's some kind of explanation. 
the DNA has a lot of information in it. It tells you what the organism is, whether it's uh, diseased, is it harmful, is it changing, responding to the environment. So you imagine if for this Internet of Living Things, then DNA-based information is going to be essential. And this is a still from a movie, 1997 movie, Gattaca, which some of you may have seen. Um, but in this still, what's shown is that DNA, a small biological sample, is being used as identification and payment. So DNA here is analogous to, um, uh, for example, an Oyster card that you know, you'd get you into the London transport system. So what kind of devices are, are bringing this, this, this kind of DNA-based world and Internet of Living Things closer? Uh, and I've already shown you uh, what that is. So we, we can get an idea of the progression towards an Internet of Living Things by making a comparison between computing, technology, and biological analysis in the form of DNA sequencing. So we know that computing has progressed uh, from the 1960s, where um, computers were large, so-called mainframe devices that filled rooms, and they were the preserve of the privileged few, like people like the young Bill Gates, and over time, in the past uh, 40, 50 years, uh, computers have gradually become smaller until we carry around in our pockets smartphones with more computing power than mainframes and even wearable computing devices. So biology, largely, in terms of DNA sequencing, has been stuck in, in the mainframe world until the last few years. Uh, a British company has brought out these very small sequences. So mainframe biology... DNA sequences, until recently, have been very large um, machines, either uh, ones that stand on the floor, like uh, this one here, or benchtop machines, and they, they require a large capital outlay, uh, lab, lab infrastructure, trained operators, and that's where we've been until recently, the last few years. And then a British tech company, British Technology, unusually, perhaps, um, they brought out these... Uh, very small, but very powerful DNA sequencing devices. Uh, and they, they, uh, so this one, example, they call the MinIron, um, and you, you just need a laptop to, to run this, and you can carry it around. These are the benchtop sequences. If you, if you move them around, then you invalidate the warranty. Uh, so they're, they're the opposite of mobile. And then the... In the near future, we'll see even smaller sequences that operate through your, your mobile phone. So it's bringing this, this Internet of Living Things closer. So you can, might consider this as a democratization of DNA sequencing or DNA-based information. So these, these sequencing devices are still largely preserve of researchers and research labs. Uh, but you can imagine years into the future, they may be in our homes, so they'll be reading out, continuously monitoring the, uh, the microbial content of your water supply. You might be using them to tell whether you're the, beer, the burgers you're putting on your barbecue are 100% beef or 95% beef and 5% horse, um, telling you whether your food is contaminated. They might be in your GP surgeries, in hospitals, even in schools, uh, school labs, certainly university labs for practical classes. So that potentially is the future uh, of this um, DNA information-based uh, network. Um, just, for the, just to finish off the present, just to tell you a bit about the research we are doing with these, these, these uh, genome sequences um, at the University of Bath. So unlike my co-presenters, I haven't had far to come. I'll just walk down the hill. So one thing I should tell you is if you're sequencing the genetic content of um, an organism, its genome, you, you don't sequence that the four million bases of the, the genome of a bacterium, for example, in one go, uh, in one large piece. What you actually do is, is break that genome up into thousands or even millions of smaller pieces. And then you sequence those small pieces. And then your job at the end of that sequencing is to put all these the sequences of all these small fragments back together in the right order so you get the correct genome sequence of your organism. And so you get your, your kind of jigsaw puzzle at the end. And it turns out the mainframe sequences, these very big machines, can only sequence relatively small fragments of DNA, so hundreds of bases long or uh, thousands of bases long. So if you look at the, a human chromosome, 
you can see the, the base pairs. So a, a piece of DNA approximately like this is all that can be sequenced by these huge DNA sequencing machines that cost hundreds of thousands of pounds uh, of your money. But it turns out these tiny DNA sequences that you can carry around in your pocket, they use a technology called nanopore sequencing that allows them to sequence much, much bigger fragments of DNA. So hundreds of thousands of bases or even millions of bases long. And why is that important? Well, for example, in, in genetic diseases and things like cancer, you get rearrangements in the genome where large chunks of the genome shift around. You get duplications of chunks of the genome. And the only way you can characterize these rearrangements and structural changes in genomes is through long read sequencing, which is what these nanopore, so-called nanopore technology-based sequences can do. So they're very powerful devices. So equally, when you do this job of, uh, you get the jigsaw puzzle at the end of sequencing all these fragments that you've, you've made, broken down the genome into, and you've got to put them back in the correct order. Um, if you've used short read sequencing, then uh, you've got a 4 million base pair bacterial genome, and you might break that down into 80,000 pieces. So you've got an 80,000 piece jigsaw puzzle at the end, essentially. I think you'll agree that's quite a challenging jigsaw puzzle. Probably uh, a Christmas present from your grandma or something. <laughs> but if you use nanopore sequences, these small sequences, uh, you, can, you can sequence much larger fragments of DNA, and therefore your, your jigsaw puzzle assembly problem at the end is, is, is much simpler. So in theory, you can sequence eight bits of DNA that are each 500,000 bases long, and so you've only got an eight-piece jigsaw puzzle at the end. So the problem's much easier with this sequencing technology. So we're using the, the, these sequences to look at a bacterium that causes whooping cough. And I was just speaking to uh, David, and he said uh, he had whooping cough. And in the pre-vaccination days, it was a very common infection. Uh, but the vaccine was introduced in the 1950s. And you can see the number of cases of whooping cough drops off a cliff. It's been very steady in the decades since. There were scares in the 70s and 80s about the vaccine causing uh, brain damage in children. So the vaccination, became, vaccination rate went down. There, was, there were a few more whooping cough cases as a result. But in the early 2000s, the vaccine was changed from including cells, killed cells of border telepertussis, the bacterium, to just a, f a bunch of small number of proteins from the bacterium. So this is the so-called acellular vaccine. So in most developed countries nowadays, the, the DTP vaccine, the pertussis component, is proteins from the bacterium. And since that was introduced, there's been a resurgence of whooping cough. So uh, you can see um, here, particularly amongst infants less than one year old, the incident rate in 2010, 2016, has gone up. It's a particularly nasty infection in, in infants. Uh, and there was a UK outbreak, outbreak in 2012. So we don't know if the bacterium is, has evolved and is re becoming resistant to the current version of the vaccine. And that's the kind of question we are trying to tackle with this sequencing technology. That um, Because it's so cheap, we can do it in our lab Otherwise, we, we wouldn't have access to this technology. So we're sequencing strains from the 2012 outbreak of border telepertussis, or whooping cough. And uh, these are plots for two of the, the UK strains, 38 and 48. And this blip in the plot for this UK strain 48 is an indication that there could be a duplication in the genome. So a chunk of this genome is present in more than one copy, potentially. And the only way to, to work out, determine whether that is truly the case and where that duplication is, is to use long read DNA sequencing. So UK38 strain, for example, if it's each of these colored rectangles represents the fragments that you've broken it down into and then put back together, then UK48 potentially has a duplication of the, the rectangle I've shown in yellow. Uh, so we don't, this, this second copy of the, the yellow um, part of the genome, it could be present here or it could be present here. Unfortunately, 
yellow shows up a lot more than uh, it should. But the idea is that you need long reads to be able to work out where these duplications are. And if we can verify where the duplications are and whether they're there at all, then we can work out whether these are causing the bacterium to be more virulent or give it a competitive advantage. And then we are trying to exploit the, the portability of these DNA sequences. They're so small you can carry them around the world. So we're forming a partnership with researchers in Paraguay to use these sequences to improve our understanding and the control of Chagas disease, which is a, a disease that's, that's carried by um, these insects, triatomine bugs, the so-called kissing bugs, because what they do is they, they um, like to take a blood meal from people uh, by biting them on their faces as, they, as, they, as people sleep. And then they leave feces around the wound, and when the person wakes up, the, the, they scratch the itchy wound and the feces get rubbed into the wound and um, a parasite that's carried in these the feces of the insect gets into the bloodstream. And years, this can be asymptomatic for years and then years later it shows up as um, a bit like a, a chronic heart problem or gastrointestinal complications. And this affects about 10 million people in, largely in the poorer parts of South American countries. So we, you can take these sequences into the field and uh, you don't need a big lab infrastructure and the smidge iron, the, the, the smaller version, will be, uh, you'll be able to operate that through a mobile phone. So that's another one of their big advantages, long reads and portability. And it's bringing this idea of the Internet of Living Things within the realms of possibility. And finally, in a scientific talk, you always thank uh, the people who actually do the work, because I just sit in my office and um, eat my sandwiches. <laughs> uh, so Natalie is a PhD student, is working at doing the border teleprotosis sequencing. Um, Andy Preston is my colleague, and he's spent 20 odd years studying border teleprotosis, this bacterium that causes whooping cough. Nick is a very interesting character. His grandfather was uh, an American Olympic swimmer and gold medal winner who met uh, Adolf Hitler at the 1936 Olympics. And uh, died only last year, I think, his grandfather. Nick's still alive. Uh, and he's setting up this partnership with research in Paraguay and other um, South American countries so we can try and help these people with, with Chagas disease. And then finally, I'd like to acknowledge um, some collaborators at University of California, Santa Cruz, that uh, have helped us get this nanopore sequencing technology working in our lab. And then you need computer power, so the Medical Research Council supplies a um, cloud computing um, resource that we, the, that we utilize. So my frontier, I don't know what that is, Internet of Living Things maybe, but I'd like to thank um, uh, very much the, the, the students and the teachers for organizing this. Hopefully it's been an enjoyable event, and thank you all for listening.